Hello. Welcome to a brand new medical surgical nursing lesson. My name is Jessie Wheatley and I'll be facilitating this lesson. Please be sure that you have your notebook ready to take notes and you have your textbook available for reference. I encourage you to highlight any key points that remain unclear and to be sure to email me for any questions. This lesson covers the RN nursing care of disorders of the nose and sinuses, obstructive sleep apnea, laryngeal disorders, and other upper airway disorders. By the end of this lesson, you should be able to discuss the pre- and post-op nursing care for the head and neck patient. You want to focus on the early identification of complications and important nursing interventions for upper airway illnesses. You want to describe patient teaching, community resources for the patient, and family who need support and educating education regarding speech therapy and communication techniques. Remember that when we're talking about non-infectious upper airway respiratory problems, we remember that the upper airway structures include the nose, the sinuses, the oropharynx, the larynx, and the trachea. Upper airway structures are important to the human need for oxygenation and tissue perfusion by providing the entrance site for that air. The main nursing priority for these disorders of the upper respiratory tract is to promote oxygenation by ensuring a patent airway. So the main focus is to make sure they have a patent airway. Throughout this short lesson, we'll talk about several disorders that affect the upper airways. It is important for you to understand the patient preparation, the procedures, the follow-up care, the medication, and everything that you need to know as far as lab diagnostic um, examination for these kind of disorders. Let's talk about nasal fractures or fracture of the nose. Nasal fractures may result from injuries received during falls, sports activities, MVAs, or any physical assault. Here is a picture of a nasal septum. And you can see the nasal bone. You can see the upper cartilage right here and the lower cartilage. When the bone and the cartilage are in alignment, treatment may not be needed. As you can see in this picture, if the bone or cartilage is displaced, serious complications can be likely. So a, cl a simple closed reduction involving the manipulation of the bones by palpations to position them in properly or alignment is effective within the first 24 hours. A rhinoplasty is a surgical reconstruction of the nose for cosmetic purposes or to improve, improve airflow. You should understand the patient preparation, the procedure, and the follow-up care for this kind of procedure. This is outlined in your textbook. Another surgical procedure outlined in your textbook is a nasoseptoplasty or a submucous resection, this may be needed to straighten a deviated septum when chronic symptoms are occurring. Neurosurgical procedures for severely deviated septums include an actual removal of part of the septal cartilage and the cartilage is then straightened uh, separate from the body and then replaced into the nose along with the sutures and the struts that are needed to keep it in place. Now let's talk about epistaxis. Epistaxis is a common problem because of the many capillaries within the nose. As you can see in this picture, there's a lot of vasculature going to that nose. We have the anterior ethmoid arteries fitting the anterior part of the nose. Nosebleeds can occur as a result of trauma, hypertension, blood dyscrasias, inflammation, a tumor, a decrease in humidity, nose blowing, nose picking, ill, 
chronic cocaine use, that's a bad habit, and procedures such as nasogastric suctioning or anything that's going in the nose. Here is another picture of the posterior arteries that are feeding that. Men are usually more affected by nosebleeds than women. We know though that posterior nasal bleeding is more common and is more serious. It's, it's more common in adults and it's, it can be an emergency. The reason posterior nasal bleeding is more serious is that a patient can lose a lot of blood very quickly. So you want to watch a patient and see how many times they're swallowing. If, if they're swallowing rapidly or you might want to, uh, if they're unconscious and they're bleeding posteriorly, we might want to uh, contact the rapid response team for posterior nasal bleeds because they have to be stopped in posterior packing and a nasal epistaxis catheter or a gel tampon is going to be used to stop the bleeding. So more common is anterior nasal bleeding, more serious is posterior nasal bleeding. This is a picture of a patient with an epistaxis catheter. As you can note, it's in place. What does this catheter look like? It's got a balloon in place that's put in to compress and allow pressure, kind of like a Foley. What are you supposed to do with this patient? Remember that this patient, you're going to check the airway and packing at least every hour or as often as needed for the patient that has posterior nasal packing. And you want to make sure that um, uh, they're not, not further bleeding. Any additional interventions at home, uh, there's a nasal plug you can buy that you can put in that expands and stops the blood, blood flow and can be stopped in an hour, but this would be probably what they would do for uncontrolled nasal bleeding in the hospital setting. We're going to take a brief moment here to talk about nasal polyps. Nasal polyps are benign grape-like clusters. You can see those in this picture benign grape-like clusters of mucous membrane and connective tissue which often are found bilaterally in the nose. Polyps are caused by irritation to the nasal mucosa and it can be from uh, in irritation in the sinuses as well from allergies or infection. If polyps become too large or if they start obstructing the airway we may need to make sure that they are uh, taken care of. Treatment for polyps is going to be steroids or it's going to be surgical removal. A poly polypectomy could be done. Now let us talk about cancers of the nose and sinuses. Tumors of the nasal cavity and sinuses can are rare and may either be malignant or they may be benign. These tumors occur at uh, peak about age 40 to 45 in men and 60 to 65 in women. This type of cancer is more common in people with exposure to chronic dust, um, wood dust, textile dust, leather dust, flour, nickel, chromium dust, mustard gas, and radium. Cigarette smoking along with other exposures increases the risk and surgical removal of all of part of the tumor is the main treatment for nasal pharyngeal cancers. It is usually combined with radiation therapy, especially intensity modulated therapy. Post-surgically, the patient is going to have um, cosmetic work done and probably they will have a prosthetic put in place. This is a patient without a prosthesis and this is the same patient with the prosthetic device in. Facial trauma is going to be described by the specific bones that are injured in the trauma. So mandibular trauma, maxillary trauma, orbital trauma, nasal fractures, and the side of the face, whatever face part of the uh, fracturing is involved is going to describe the trauma. The most common are mandibular and uh, maxillary traumas. The priority is to establish a patent airway. That's going to be your biggest nursing priority. You want to make sure that the patient's uh, facial injuries are not impeding ability to get air. Um, you want to make sure that you are anticipating the need for an emergency intubation, a tracheostomy, a cricothyroidectomy if needed. 
Uh, facial traumas may be repaired by microplating um, where uh, the damage is and uh, more extensive jaw fractures may require an open reduction internal succession and uh, remember that when the patient has had mandibular fractures and they have some mandibular immobilization you want to remind them that um, not remind them you might want to make sure that you have wire cutters at the bedside at all times Obstructive sleep apnea, guys, is when uh, breathing disruption during sleep that lasts at least 10 seconds and occurs minimum of five times in an hour. That's what's going to be diagnostic as obst obstructive sleep apnea. The most common form occurs as a result of upper airway obstruction by the soft palate of the tongue and obesity is the biggest risk factor for this kind of uh, apnea. Vocal cord paralysis um, may come as from injuries or trauma or disease that's affecting the larynx, the laryngeal nerves, or the vagus nerve. And uh, prolonged intubation may cause a little bit of a temporary vocal cord par paralysis. Uh, it is rarely permanent. Vocal cord nodules are enlarged fibrous tissues caused by infectious processes or overuse of the vocal cord. Uh, the voice in uh, they often appear where the vocal cords touch during speech people most affected by vocal cord nodules are those who speak very loudly such as teachers coaches sports fans and singers I'm gonna speak really really soft now because I'm scared of getting vocal cord nodules on my vocal cords because I'm a teacher no, just pay attention. Okay, so vocal cord polyps are chronic edematous masses which occur most often in smokers, people with allergies, or those who live in dry climates. Vo nodules and polyps are usually painless on the vocal cord, and the main symptom is uh, a painless hoarseness by uh, the patient. And because of the loss of coordinated closure of the vocal cords or the vocal wave and then when they go in they find out that they may have had a polyp in there. Let's talk about uh, the laryngeal trauma. The larynx may be traumatized with a crushing or direct blow injury uh, or fracture or anything like that that is induced it could also be induced from prolonged intubation. Upper airway obstruction is a life-threatening emergency in which there's an interruption of airflow through the nose or the mouth or the pharynx or the larynx. And early recognition is essential to prevent further complications from happening, uh, including respiratory arrest. Some incipitated oral or nasopharyngeal secretions may lead to obstruction or asphyxiation. So it's important to watch patients that are at risk for that. So make sure that you're providing good oral hygiene to the patient. Make sure that there's not a lot of thickening. Uh, the secretions are not too thick. Proper assessment and nursing care is listed very well in your book to avoid an emergent upper airway obstruction. A cricothyroidectomy is a stab wound at the cricothyroid membrane between the thyroid cartilage and the cricothyroid cricoid cart cartilage um, ring performed in an emergency to open the airway or to access the airway as shown. Another option available may be endotracheal intubation, which is performed by inserting a tube into the trachea via the nose or mouth, especially uh, done by specially trained personnel. In another video, we'll go in depth about endotracheal intubation. We have talked extensively about a tracheotomy, which is a surgical incision into the trachea for the purpose of establishing an airway. In an upper airway obstruction situation, this would be done emergently, but it can also be a scheduled procedure. In taking care of these patients, we want to make sure we're using sterile technique when performing endotracheal or tracheal suctioning. We want to assess any stomas uh, per shift for um, 
all signs of infection and we want to use aspiration precautions in these patients, especially if they have altered level of consciousness and they have an ET tube in place. We want to keep the tracheal cuff between uh, uh, 14 to 20 millimeters to prevent any tissue injury. I'll go in details about that. Uh, you want to make sure that you have manual resuscitation to ventilate patients. If the tracheostomy tube has been dislodged or has been decannulated, you want to make sure that O2 therapy is being, that's being delivered to this patient is humidified and warm. As RN, you want to encourage a nurse uh, with, per, uh, you want to encourage and the patient that's going to have this long term uh, about uh, teaching and want to involve the family as much as you can. We have talked about other traumas, but neck injuries may be caused by a knife, a gunshot wound, a traumatic accident. Uh, manifestations uh, of laryngeal trauma include, or neck trauma, include difficulty breathing, uh, hoarseness, subcutaneous emphysema around the neck area. Uh, we want to make sure that the patient is not bleeding from the airway. Um, priority for neck trauma is going to be patent airway, patent airway. We have talked about other cancers. Head and neck cancers can be devastating, even if successful treatment, or you know, you know it's going to it has the potential to disrupt breathing, eating, uh, facial appearance, self-image, speech, and communication. So the RN care needs to be about making sure that you're handling the complexity of the situation and you're coordinating care and you're making sure that every a comprehensive team approach is present in taking care of this patient. You want to allow this patient and family member the opportunity to express themselves about their anxiety and the grief and anything that they feel about this diagnosis. You want to allow time to communicate with the patient who has lost their voice so don't be in a hurry you want to teach this patient how to take care of their skin and how to take care of themselves you want to encourage the patient with head and neck cancer to look at their wound and to touch the affected area and be okay with it okay uh, you also want to refer this patient to the american cancer society or the canadian cancer society after surgery for support Thank you for listening to this lesson. I hope you enjoyed this lesson on non-infectious upper airway respiratory disorders. For questions about this lesson or any corresponding notes, email me at the address listed here. And I hope you have a wonderful day.